Uh, dear student, Assalamu alaikum. I welcome you to lecture number six. In this lecture, I will be covering mainly some con cost uh, concepts. These concepts are extremely important, and let's say if you're a project manager, or let's say if you're working in any organization as an engineer, uh, you should be able to distinguish between uh, different cost uh, concepts. Before I proceed uh, to the cost concepts, let me give you a quick uh, recap. So in lecture number five, we covered different types of interest. One was simple and the other was, was uh, compound. In simple interest, actually the interest is earned only on the principal amount. So principal only And in compound, actually, interest is earned is earned both on interest that we previously earned and the principal amount. Okay, and as I said, do not worry about this right now because we will be covering this uh, in chapter number two quite in detail. The most important one from lecture number five was the minimum attractive rate of return. We use this rate actually for project evaluation and selection. And the starting point is weighted average cost of capital. So whenever you are trying to undertake a project, if you are planning to undertake a project, you need, of course, some capital for that. The, there are two main sources of capital. One is equity and the other one is debt. So whenever you are using multiple sources of financing, of course, in order to arrive at a single rate of uh, cost of capital, uh, we have to average it out. Uh, but it's not a simple average. In fact, it's a vetted average. This relationship is super important. So your expected rate of return uh, of any project, it should be more than the minimum uh, attractive rate of return because minimum attractive rate of return as it is uh, at, at the name suggests it is the minimum that i want actually from a project so if the required rate of return of a project is more than the minimum rate we accept that project okay uh, the relationship between marr and wag again it's very simple if the project return is only VAC, so if ROR is equal to VAC, I talked about this relationship quite in detail. So if ROR is equal to VAC, it means that the project is enough, I mean the project return is only enough to pay for its equity holders and debt holders, okay? And it does not create any value. But let's say if the ROR is greater than WAC, of course, some part will be paid to equity holders and debt holders, and the remaining will add value to the company. So this relationship is extremely important to understand. Okay, and uh, the logic is very simple. The relationship is very, very intuitive. So some cost concepts, okay? So in today's lecture, I will introduce you to some cost concepts. Uh, and as I said, you will be using this almost on a daily basis uh, if you're working, let's say, in any organization as a project manager or uh, in any other role, okay? So fixed cost and variable cost. These are the main two types, okay? So fixed cost are those costs that do not vary with the level of production. Okay, examples, a rent of a building. Okay, so you're paying rent for a building. Um, if you're producing, let's say, 100 units, let's say 1,000 units. Okay, suppose the building can, let's say, uh, is capable uh, to accommodate, let's say, enough machinery where you could produce 1,000 units as well. So let's say if you're, if you're producing only 100 units, you are still paying the same rent. 
Similarly, in a classroom, let's say if I'm teaching to 10 students, okay, or if I'm te teaching, uh, let's say, to 50 students, okay, so my salary to the institute would be like a fixed cost, okay. Salary to permanent uh, employees, okay, insurance of a building, okay. It uh, doesn't matter if you are producing less or producing more, uh, normally insurance is linked with the covered area of uh, that building, okay. Uh, of course, depreciation in taxes is also another form of uh, fixed assets. Depreciation, a little bit of, uh, a little bit disagree actually, because sometimes one of the depreciation methods is linked with the level of production. Okay, but other methods they are not. Okay, uh, so yes, partly depreciation is part of a fixed cost, um, but uh, one of the type of depreciation it is not. Taxes, normally property taxes, okay, that you pay. Uh, variable cost, on the other hand, it does vary with the level of production, okay. So, for example, raw material, okay. So, if you're producing more, of course, you need more raw material, okay. So, the variable cost it actually varies, okay. And I told you in my first lecture, the best thing about uh, uh, any terminology in English, it actually tells you half of the story, okay? So this variable cost is the cost which varies, fixed cost which is fixed, which means it does not vary, okay? Uh, another example would be, let's say, electricity bills and salary of daily wage uh, employees, okay? So if you are producing more, of course, your electricity bill will be more. And uh, if you are, let's say, need only 10 employees to produce 1000 units you may need more employees to produce 1000 units total cost as the name suggests it's a total cost of production okay so it represents the sum of both fixed cost and variable cost okay and of course this is the formula so total cost is total fixed cost Plus total variable cost. Simple, plain and simple. Average cost. Okay. For a specified time, sorry, for a specified pe uh, time period is calculated by dividing the firm's total cost of number of units produced. So this is the total cost uh, that has in that has been incurred, let's say, for a certain level of production. So in a way, you are calculating unit cost, okay? So it's a unit cost. So for example, let's say if my total cost is $1,000 to produce 50 units, okay? So my cost would be 20 per unit, okay? So that's the average cost. Average cost is the cost of one unit as it is also mentioned, okay? Average cost can also be computed by adding average fixed cost and average variable cost. So total cost, as you can see, is fixed cost plus variable cost. If I divide it by total number of units, okay? So divide both sides by N, this is the average fixed cost. Again, grade six uh, mathematics, okay, and average variable cost okay so plain simple now economies of scale okay this is a term uh, which is coming straight from a uh, basic microeconomics uh, course uh, the concept is extremely simple so for example let me write it down for you fixed cost is let's say one hundred dollars okay Variable cost per unit of production is, let's say, $2, okay? So if I would like to know the total cost or the, let's say the unit, uh, per unit total cost of for production for uh, various level of productions, okay? So units produced, let's say 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay? Let's go with a simple example, okay? Total cost and let's go with $2. 
go to unit cost okay so total cost would be how much it would be 100 that's a fixed component okay and then one multiplied by this is the variable cost okay so 100 in 2 so my per unit cost is 100 in 2 divided by 1 which is 100 in 2 okay uh, units produce 2 so my total cost would be 100 because this this part is fixed it is not changing okay with the level of production and 2 multiplied by 2 which is equal to 104 unit cost would be 104 divided by 2 so which is 52 okay for 3 units produced same mathematics okay so 106 so 106 divided by 3 which is almost 35.3 okay 4 units okay by 2 which is 108 108 divided by 2 so the unit sorry divided by 4 so the unit cost would be 27 okay so as you can see with every additional unit that we are producing the per unit cost is actually going down okay as you can see from this graph as well this this graph what it essentially says uh, that the long run average cost as you can see okay so let's say initially the company was producing only Q1 units okay and the cost per unit was P1 okay and then once the company increases its production okay the unit cost actually comes down and then it flattens out okay as you can see in my example the first few units the reduction is huge okay and then the the graph actually flattens out and there is a point actually when it starts increasing again and the reason is let's say uh, if you need only one facility uh, for production up to let's say 100,000 units okay but let's say if you would like to produce more than 100,000 units you need another facility which means more cost okay so the cost then keeps on increasing again okay so economies of scale what it really tells you that whenever the company is producing more and more okay there is an optimal point where the average cost of production is actually minimum so that is the optimal point uh, so that's why companies which are smaller normally they con cannot compete with larger companies smaller companies their average uh, cost of production is higher than larger firms and the reason economies of scale where is the economy scale coming from from fixed component of cost okay so there is a component of cost which is fixed which means it does not vary with the level of production okay so it's a very very important concept in microeconomics uh, and uh, you should be able to understand this one as well now marginal cost marginal cost measures the increase in total cost that arises due to production of an extra unit okay so suppose if the company was producing only one unit okay for two units the total cost of production is now 104 okay so by producing an additional unit actually the company's total cost increased by two dollars so that's the marginal cost so change in cost divided by change in quantity okay so the change in cost in my example was two dollars and change in quantity was sorry this is number by one okay so it's two dollars okay so marginal cost is the measure which actually tells you that how much does a company need to produce an extra unit okay private and social cost now again this is a very very important concept okay private cost is the cost 
of an action which is paired by the actor only okay so suppose there is okay let me actually write it down here okay so suppose there is a producer okay so it's like a uh, producer okay and here is actually a consumer okay this producer let's say produces uh, for example motorbikes so motorcycle okay and this uh, consumer actually goes here okay pays some money to the producer and the producer gave him or her actually a motorcycle okay so for producer this transaction entails only what they call private benefit okay for this consumer it entails private cost okay so the cost for consumer it's private it's only limited to the actor okay only limited to the people or organizations which are involved in this transaction okay so that's why they're called private costs or private benefits okay example a producers or suppliers cost of providing goods or services it includes internal cost incurred incur for inputs labor rent and depreciation but exclude what they call external costs what would be those externalities so externalities again a technical term or in literature it's also called the spillover effects okay what are the spillovers or the externalities if this individual is driving this motorcycle what it does it produces pollution okay and that pollution actually everybody pays for it everybody in the society okay that is called social cost okay so social cost okay another example would be let's say if a company is producing uh, and unfortunately they need let's say uh, water for uh, production let's say in the uh, in the production process if they do not treat the water what really happens is it goes actually into the man let's say uh, water vans like canals or anything else okay now the city government what they do in order to provide water for their citizens they have to actually clean it okay so they install water treatment plants okay uh, whatever the cost is incurred by the local government that cost is distributed among the whole society okay so in a way whatever the initial actor did uh, that cost was distributed among the society okay so that's that's the social cost social cost includes the private cost and the externalities okay so social cost normally of any transaction is more because there is a private cost so this individual is also part of the society but of course there are some externalities as well so if we add those externalities the social cost uh, is more okay uh, the expense to an entire society result from from an activity example driving a bike so same example okay so what it does private cost would be fuel and maintenance of the bike so for this individual okay whenever he or she buys a bike okay uh, the private cost would be let's say fuel consumption and maintenance cost but the social cost would be pollution and wear tear of the roads so imagine let's say if somebody does not have a car the government still pays for the maintenance of roads okay uh, poor individuals they do not use these uh, roads for example motorways uh, on daily basis and people with money they are using it so this cost is actually externalized okay it is distributed among the society members of the society okay so it entails social cost as well okay so something very important there is a private cost uh, attached to a certain transaction and there may be I'm not saying that the social cost exists like all the time but there may be a social cost as well opportunity cost 
very very important concept again opportunity cost is the true economic cost of any decision so whatever decision we make there is a cost attached to it opportunity cost is the cost of second choice second best choice actually that you left for doing or getting your first choice or opportunity cost is the value of the best foregone alternative to any decision do not worry about these definitions i'll give you some numerical examples and the whole concept will be uh, crystal clear for you okay so don't worry about that whatever decision that you make okay what do we do in a decision making process okay so we have different alternatives okay so alternative number 1 alternative number 2 and let's say there are only three alternatives okay alternative number 3 okay so suppose i rank these okay and alternative number 1 turns out to be the best alternative for me okay uh, alternative number 2 is let's say is the second best alternative so let's say if i choose alternative number 1 opportunity cost is actually the cost okay of not choosing alternative number 2 okay to give an example the opportunity cost of higher education so suppose after under under your undergraduate degree if you would like to go for a higher education okay you could go for a higher education let's say if, if you are doing your uh, phd okay phd normally takes 4 to 5 years okay those 4 to 5 years you could easily go and let's say start a business or let's say you you can look for a job or alternatively you can go and let's say travel around the world okay so there is a cost to each decision opportunity cost is the true cost of any decision and where is it coming from it's coming from the cost of second best choice or in other words it's the value of the best foregone alternative so i forgot I, what did i do let's say i forego this alternative among the two like the two and three this was the best alternative that i did not choose okay examples and this is a real example i was watching uh, a video from uh, uh, a university professor she is teaching in university of virginia so she gave this example to her class okay a 13 story profitable hotel in hong kong was actually knocked down the owners thought that it will be more profitable to build a high rise building and rent it out to office spaces okay so the question is why was the building demolished when it was profitable so on a piece of paper the 13 story building hotel was very very profitable okay but even then the owners thought that it's not a bad idea to knock it down uh, build a high-rise building and then uh, rent it out for office uh, spaces for offices okay so in the whole analysis if we include the foregone profits of the best alternative okay so one alternative was so alternative number one was as is which is hotel so don't do anything just run the hotel okay and make money alternative number two was demolish hotel and build high rise building okay that was alternative number two so if we include the foregone profits which is alternative number two of the best alternative as cost then the hotel was not profitable okay so assume the hotel was making only uh, let's say one thousand uh, hundred thousand dollars let's say per day or per month okay let's go with per month okay and the best alternative is let's say has the potential to make 
200,000, double the money. Okay, I would do exactly the same thing. I would demolish the building, okay, and will uh, build a high-rise building, okay. In the whole decision-making process, of course, you take into account the cost of demolition and the cost of raising the new building as well, okay. So this is like a real case. That building, that hotel was actually knocked down and a high-rise building was uh, constructed, okay. So in simple words, the owners will be better off if they demolish the building and replace it with a high-rise building, okay. Now, example, okay. If somebody asks you, what is the opportunity cost of your GK undergraduate degree, let's say per year, okay. So if you see the GK fees per year, I'm assuming let's say it's 800,000 institution fees per and some other fees as well, okay. So that is the true cost, let's say that is the cost of GIK degree uh, per year, okay. But what about, let's say, the foregone wages? So let's say if you're reading, if you're studying in GIK, of course you cannot work. Assume that you, are, you, you cannot work, okay. I assume that, okay, you guys have the potential, let's say, to earn 40,000 rupees per month. Okay, so the foregone wages for uh, one year is $480,000. Now, the true economic cost, okay, so on paper, the cost looks like $800,000, but the true economic cost, what is also called opportunity cost, is actually $1.28 million per year, okay, and this, this looks now like a huge uh, amount. It's not a small amount. Example number one. It's an American example. Again, I borrowed it from uh, that professor who is teaching in the University of Virginia. Okay, so Steve bought a fully refundable ticket, plane ticket, to Florida for spring break, which cost him hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, a week before spring break, Steve Steve's roommate Harry invites Steve to come stay with him in New York. Or break. Assume this is the only alternative. Okay, so train ticket to New York cost fifty dollars. The only expense, and Steve knows that he will get two hundred and fifty dollars worth of benefit if he if he goes to New York. What is Steve opportunity cost of going to Florida? Okay, so the ticket cost was hundred and fifty dollars. Okay, that is the ticket cost of going to Florida. But actually, the friend invited Steve, and let's say if Steve would like to uh, accept the invitation, of course, he has to buy $50 ticket, so that is cost, okay? But he anticipates that my benefit of going to New York is $250, so the net benefit of going to New York is actually $200, so the opportunity cost of going to Florida is 150 plus 200 okay so 150 is the actual cost but at the same time Steve is losing $200 by not going to uh, New York so the opportunity cost of going to Florida is 350 again 150 is the actual cost uh, the, the, the airplane ticket uh, and the 200 is actually the foregone benefit of not going to uh, New York. Now I will add uh, a twist to this example, okay? And now pay attention to this one. So the ticket initially was refundable, okay? Refundable means that Steve can actually cancel it. Now what happens, let's say, if the ticket is non-refundable? Okay, so same example, a non-refundable ticket costed Steve $150, okay. If he accepts his friend's invitation and would like to go to New York, he would like to buy a $50 uh, ticket, but the benefit of going to New York is $250. Now this is tricky. This ticket cost 
is 150, but since this is non-refundable, we call it sunk cost. This one has gone. This money is gone. Okay. Sunk cost it does not affect your decision. Okay. So would it be wise on part of Steve to let's say go to to go to uh, to go to Florida only because of the fact that he bought a ticket that ticket is anyways non-refundable okay so it's a sunk cost that's gone okay theoretically it should not affect your decision okay so the net benefit of going to New York stays the same which is $200 and now the opportunity cost of going to Florida is only $200 okay initially it was 350 why was it 350 because the hundred and fifty dollars was refundable okay Steve could have got his money back okay Steve could uh, get that money back but in this case since the money is non refundable and it is gone if it is gone you do not have to bring that money into equation because that's a gone money okay uh, so your opportunity cost has actually gone down now prospective cost prospective cost is a future or past cost that can be recovered okay sunk cost cannot be recovered as I told you on the previous slide okay but prospective cost can be recovered in other words is the cost that can be altered by your current or future decision and strategies so suppose if you buy a piece of land let's say to start a business that is something that actually you can recoup in future so you can recoup your investment you can get your money back okay uh, economic theory suggests to focus on prospective costs while making business decision so as I told you uh, you do not have to bring some cost in equation because that cost is gone that is no more relevant relevant to your decision making but prospective cost is relevant to your decision making because you can recover that okay uh, prospective cost can be controlled okay through your of course decision making either you can buy you can sell it you can sell it completely or you can sell it in let's say in parts okay prospective costs are often contrasted with sunk cost so it's like the opposite of sunk cost now sunk cost in a little bit detail is the cost that is that has already been incurred and cannot be recovered sunk cost differs from the future cost that a business may face such as money spent on training of the staff of an organization okay it does not matter what future action organization takes such costs are not recoverable okay some costs are excluded from future business decisions because the cost will be the same regardless of the outcome of the decision okay because the, the cost has already been incurred and it's non reversible if it is incurred and non reversible why should it uh, let's say affect my future decisions okay so that's the whole point uh, for example let's say cost of writing a proposal okay so if you are if you're working with a consultant uh, you will be writing proposals on daily basis okay uh, and let's say if you're applying for, for a project if you are bidding for a project and if you submit your proposal whatever cost uh, you incurred in terms of let's say labor cost in terms of uh, time of your uh, let's say uh, engineers okay you cannot get that money back because that is gone okay so it should not in a, in, in, in a, fundamentally it should not affect your decision making examples of unfortunately this is not okay so let me make one correction so it's some cost okay so example of some cost 
Let's assume an engineering firm wants to launch a new power bank uh, in the market. The firms spend a lot on market research, okay, product development, and advertisement. So these things like market research, product development, okay, and advertisement, normally these costs are incurred and they go only in one direction. They are uh, irreversible. Irrespective of all efforts, market reacted negatively towards the launch of new power bank. Okay? If the firm still decide to continue with the same product that failed in the market on the basis of past investment, it will not be an economic decision. Okay? So do you think it's a wise decision uh, if the company thinks that, oh, I spend, let's say, $100,000 on market research, product development, and advertisement. Although the customers did not like the product, I should still go for marketing. I should still, uh, let's say, uh, produce this product and launch it in the market. Do you think it's a wise decision because the company thinks that, oh, I already spent $100,000? No, it's what we call throwing good money after bad money. Okay? So there is a saying, do not throw good money after bad money okay so if the market is not responding positively to the product the company should not launch that product if they do it will be like they are throwing good money after bad money and um, they will actually increase their losses okay so the whole point of discussion is that some cost does not affect your decision making it should not okay because that cost goes only in one direction they are irreversible costs and as the last bullet says these are the costs that must be ignored if the product has no potential, the firm should stop and focus on new products. That's a logical conclusion. Okay. There is another concept, it's called sinking fund. So please do not confuse sinking fund with sunk cost. It's an entirely different animal. Okay. The sinking fund, it's not a, it's it's neither an expense. Uh, it, and it is also not related actually with the sunk cost. Okay. Now some engineering costs. One is operation and maintenance costs, recurring and non-recurring costs, sunk cost and capital costs. Okay. Uh, I already covered sunk cost, so let me go and talk about a little bit of operations and maintenance. Okay. As the name suggests, cost of an asset okay and the cost is associated with operating and maintaining that particular asset so let's say if you install uh, a machinery of course you need to operate that machinery and you need regular maintenance as well okay so those costs are normally classified as operation and maintenance cost okay uh, these costs incur continually okay for the life uh, of that particular asset may include labor cost for operations okay so you need operators okay for the machinery uh, of course you need to maintain that machinery okay fuel uh, power cost spare and repairs okay these costs can be substantial and can exceed the initial cost as well okay so sometimes the operations and maintenance cost for a certain project uh, it's a significant amount so you cannot ignore it so whenever you are writing a proposal, you should uh, pay attention to operations and maintenance cost of uh, that project. Uh, recurring and non-recurring uh, cost. Recurring cost is a regular cost, okay, uh, and it has a pattern, okay. So it's recurring all the time, okay. That's why it's regular and it has a pattern okay these costs are known you can easily anticipate them and they also occur at regular intervals 
for example, let's say payment of salaries, okay? You pay to your employees, let's say, let's say once in a month, okay? You pay rents, let's say, on a monthly basis, and you also pay utilities on a monthly basis. So these costs, as you can see, most of the time they are known. You can easily anticipate them, and they occur uh, at regular intervals. Some of the costs, they are not recurring, okay? They are unusual. And the unusual cost would be, let's say, uh, for example, would be design, let's say, cost uh, involved in design and development, okay? Investment cost, let's say, God forbid, let's say, if there is a fire or theft, okay, lawsuit payments and losses uh, on sale of assets. So suppose if you have a machinery, I'm explaining th this last point, okay? For example, you have car, company cars, let's say for executives or let's say for delivery. After a certain time, let's say five years or six years, uh, you, you sell those cars. You sell those cars, okay? Now selling of those cars, uh, and let's say uh, your company is, let's say, OGDCL, okay? So it's oil and gas company, okay? Now, selling cars is not the main business of OGDCL, okay? So selling cars, it's a non-recurring uh, recurring transaction, okay? And these costs are non-recurring as well, okay? So anything which is not regular in nature, those are classified as non-recurring cost. Non-recurring costs are also called extraordinary cost. Okay. Sinking fund. Okay. Sinking fund is a fund established by an economic entity. Okay. And where do you create this fund from? From revenues. Or a period of time to fund a future capital expenditure or repayment of the long-term debt. Okay, so suppose uh, Engro. Okay, suppose at one point in time Engro might have thought that after two years we would like to start a food business. Okay, if from their revenues, if they would like to let's say contribute hundred million each year to a fund that okay with this fund after two years we will actually start um, we we'll start building a new facility where they could let's say launch another uh, line of business let's say food okay so this would be a typical example of sinking fund okay so you set aside some revenues okay for a specific purpose okay that particular fund is called sinking fund okay I personally contribute to my kids what they call RESP. Okay? So it's an education saving plan. Okay? Now, this particular account, it's a bank account. It's a bank account. Okay? In which individuals like myself. and government okay contribute and this fund is only meant for education of my kids so if my kids are let's say uh, in the university going age okay they can utilize this fund okay uh, so revenues if you set aside a portion of it create a fund for a specific purpose that particular fund is called sinking fund okay Sinking fund is also created for a repayment of some long-term debt. So, for example, if PTCL would like to borrow through bonds, okay? So, they sell bonds and then they generate some money. So, they would like to, let's say, finance a certain project through bonds, Okay, so whenever they sell bonds, of course, it is their liability. After the bond matures, PTCL has to repay the principal amount to the bondholders. So what they do normally, 
it's 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 not a normal practice. It really depends on 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 companies' management. But sometimes companies, what they do, they create a fund. Create fund for bond payment. Okay. So suppose it's a ten years bond, and PTCL thinks that okay, I will create a fund. I will keep on contributing uh, a certain amount in this fund, of course, from revenues so that after 10 years I have enough money in the account so that I am able to pay to my bond holders okay so that's a typical sinking fund okay so it is a fund created okay the contribution is coming from revenues and it is meant for a specific purpose okay it's either future capital expense or repayment of long-term debt okay or as I said it can be for a specific purpose like for example uh, for education of my children Okay. A sinking fund can also be used by an economic activity by setting aside revenue or a period of time or a period of time for the purpose of replacing capital equipment. Okay, and as it becomes, let's say, obsolete, uh, major, it needs major maintenance, or you would like to, let's say, renew, uh, renew uh, the fixed assets such as building and uh, fixtures. Okay, uh, so it can be actually for specific purpose as well for example replacement of capital equipment okay so let's say nishat textile mills nishat textile mills creates a sinking fund and they would like to replace their let's say spinning uh, what's it called machinery whatever okay uh, after five years okay and the purpose is that after five years nishat is aiming to have enough money in that sinking fund so that they are able to replace those uh, the, the old machinery that they are having uh, in their mills. Capital cost is the is also called the first cost or the initial cost. Okay, uh, you might have heard a lot of time actually if you are uh, reading. Um, let's say business articles okay capital investment okay so it is the investment that you need for, for the, to meet the first time cost or the initial cost capital cost of fixed one time expenses okay uh, you can either purchase land with it buildings construction uh, or you can use uh, that money for acquiring let's say equipment which you need for production uh, or let's say rendering even services okay in other words it is the total cost needed to bring a project to a commercially operatable status okay so now this is very very important okay if you start a business if you start a project okay in the whole project life cycle there comes a point where your project becomes commercially operatable. You can use it for commercial purposes. Okay, So capital cost is the total cost which you need to bring that project to the level where you can commercially operate it. Capital cost include expenses from both tangible assets, for both tangible assets, such as purchase of land and building, and it can also include intangible assets, for example, trademarks, copyrights, patents. Okay. In order to register a patent, or let's say buy copyrights, you have to make some. You have to incur some cost. These costs are also called capital costs. Okay. So capital costs can be tan can be. So capital costs can be incurred for tangible assets. They can be also incurred for intangible assets and as I said capital costs are fixed and are therefore independent of the level of output okay so if for example uh, coming back to Engro example if they would like to start a new business um, let's say for example food for uh, packaging of uh, different let's say food items um, they would like to install uh, a new facility in a different city. 
So regardless of the level of production, of course, at a certain point in time, it will come into play. Uh, but normally, uh, it is independent of the level of output. So you uh, build a facility and then it is up to the management whether they would like to produce, let's say, uh, 1,000 units, 100,000 units, or let's say 500,000 units. Okay, so the capital cost is normally independent of the level of output. Example, okay, so fossil uh, fuel power plant, okay, what kind of capital expenditures uh, it may have? Purchase of land, okay, uh, permits and legal costs. Okay, so in order to acquire land, of course, you need to pay some legal fees. Okay, in order to start a facility, of course, you need some government uh, permissions. Okay, and it 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 uh, it needs uh, some expenses. Okay, equipment needed to run the plant, you need some equipment, of course. Uh, cost involving the construction of the plant, financing and commissioning of the plant. Okay, so it may include all the all these costs okay and we can still classify them as capital cost because the definition as you remember was that all the cost uh, of a project to the point when it becomes commercially operatable okay so you need land you need building you need equipment okay they do not include the cost of natural gas okay fuel oil or coal used once the plant enters commercial operation okay so it does not need these costs the reason is you will only incur these costs when the once the project becomes operational okay uh, un unless and until it is commercially operational uh, so to the point it becomes commercially um, operational all those costs can be classified as capital costs but after it becomes commercially operational okay so this is point let me write it down for you commercially operational okay so this is a timeline okay this is time zero okay which is today present okay and let's say this is time t and this is time t prime okay so from 0 to t whatever cost that we incur it will be classified as capital cost but anything after t anything in this time zone uh, it will not be classified as capital cost because the uh, project is already commercially operational incremental costs an incremental cost is the difference between the cost of two alternatives. So suppose you're considering to buy two different uh, machineries. Okay. Uh, of course, there is a purchase price, there is carriage, installation cost, maintenance cost, utility expenses, depreciation expenses. Some of one of the machines will be, let's say, more uh, energy efficient the other uh, compared to the other one. Okay. So if you plot all individual expenses of pro uh, project number X and project number Y, the difference between these two are called incremental costs. Okay, so for example, project number Y will cost me ten thousand dollars more in purchase price, so that's the incremental cost of purchase. Okay, uh, shipping will the uh, project Y will cost me $200 more, okay? Uh, but of course, I get benefit of, let's say, less maintenance cost, okay? Uh, this uh, project project Y is uh, more energy efficient, okay? So I set some money. So incremental cost is important in a way because it gives you everything in a glance, okay? Uh, which project is saving you more money? Okay, and if you would like to, let's say, dig down further, which uh, project is saving you more under which head? So, for example, uh, this eleven $1 hundred dollars. Okay, it's a substantial amount in terms of saving, uh, but this ten thousand dollars is huge because it costs more. Okay, so incremental cost gives you an idea 
which project uh, is more beneficial in terms of like cost saving. Life cycle cost. Okay, so every product has a life cycle. Okay, so product life cycle is a cycle through which every product goes through the introduction, from withdrawal, or eventual demise. So some product it has a natural life and they die their natural death. Some products are actually withdrawn. Uh, for example, uh, Microsoft. Okay. So the processors, okay, we started, let's say, with uh, Core i3, Core i5, Core i7. We may have some other uh, more advanced um, processors, okay. But these are actually withdrawn by the company, okay. They do not dry, die uh, the natural, uh, I mean, they, they do not exhaust its uh, use of life. So every product actually has a life cycle, okay. So life cycle cost is the sum of total cost inter incurred during the life cycle of the product. So the life cycle cost is the total cost throughout the life cycle of a certain product. So that's the life cycle cost. Okay, that's a different term. Okay. Life cycle costing, okay, it's a process of estimating how much money you will spend on the product over a course of its useful life. Life cycle costing covers an asset cost from the time you purchase it to the time you get rid of it. Okay, so simple. Okay, there are some stages of product life cycle as well. Okay, so everything starts with product development. Okay, and then you introduce that product to the market. Okay, once you introduce it, and of course your sales keeps on going higher and higher. You, you reach a growth stage, okay, and from this point to this point, okay, you make lots of money, okay. So in the growth stage, of course, your sales starts going up, and in the maturity stage, you are still, uh, you're still making money. And in this stage in marketing, sometimes we call those product as cash house, okay. So you can still milk the product like for cash, uh, although it's not in the growth stage, it's in the maturity stage, but you're still making money, okay? And after the competition, of course, uh, the sales goes down, okay? So at the start of the, starting from the product development until the very end of this product, okay, you have a different uh, product life cycle, okay? starting with growth, entering into maturity, and then decline, okay? So the whole process starts with product development, then we introduce it to the market. Uh, the, this is the growth stage where the sales of our product uh, goes higher and higher, and then it enter, enters maturity stage, and with passage of time, and with, uh, let's say, more competitive products entering the market, it goes down. Stages of the product life cycle, again, product is being designed, okay. In the introduction stage, what happens actually sales are low initially, okay. Profits will be negative because you need a minimum uh, units to be sold, let's say to hit what they call break even, okay. Below that, you are making losses, okay. Product may be unknown, okay. So people do not know about your product, okay? It may be unknown to the people, okay? In growth stages, what happens, sales increasing rapidly, profits will reach their highest at the end of the stage, okay? As you can see, the profit is uh, reaching actually uh, to the highest point, but in this stage actually, of course, okay? Then in maturity, sales reach its highest point again, a rate of growth slows, uh, as you can see, there is a very, very sharp growth here, okay, but the growth here flattens out, okay. Uh, competitors enter the market. Once competitors see uh, that you are making money from this product, what they do, they enter the market as well, okay. So technology companies normally, they fare really well. The reason is those products are not very easy to uh, to let's say replicate, okay? 
so hard to compete. In saturation state, similar products enter the market, price lower because of the competition, and then some businesses may be forced off the market. So some businesses beyond a certain point, uh, they cannot compete and they're just, uh, they're forced out, okay? Uh, sales falling profits continue to fall, okay, in decline stage. If you read literature in economics, most of the companies actually fail in development and introduction stage, okay? Because in these two stages, your company is most likely not profitable, as you can see here, okay? You are not making any money. Your profits are actually below zero, which means that you're making losses. So in this stage, most of the companies actually they close down, especially small businesses. They, they do not have enough cushion, enough meat to absorb those losses. Okay, so if you do not plan your product life cycle well, uh, you, you may be in trouble actually. You can be kicked out uh, either in product development or introduction stage. Okay, so it's really, really important to plan for the whole product life cycle. Okay. Uh, this was uh, it for today. Uh, read my slides. If you have any confusion, any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me at mazulaegki.edu.pk. I thank you very much uh, for your attention again. Have a great day.